four-part radio series about mind-altering drugs in nature and culture. Written and presented by Nick Rankin. Plants of Power. Program 1. Brain Power. Hello. People and plants go back a long way together. And this series is about our chemical connection, a story of dangers and delights. Plants make chemicals to protect themselves. Some of them are poisons. And we people need chemicals to live. The human brain works on chemicals. Your moods, thoughts and feelings are governed by drugs manufactured naturally in your body. This series argues that drugs are part of our nature, common to all human cultures. Plants of power trace our secret history and help to reveal our inner selves. Plants produce phenomenally complex compounds that are probably to do with attracting or repelling other life forms. By chance, those products have equally remarkable effects on the human nervous system and the brain, which is the most complex organ in the known universe. Plants are unimaginably powerful. I'm Dr. Clive Cohen. I'm from King's College London. I work in the biomedical sciences department and my main interest is in neuroscience. Neuroscience is the science of the brain. Science of the brain and the spinal cord and the peripheral nervous system. Now the brain is sort of wetware sloshing around in our skull. It is chemical. It's a chemical system, isn't it? It's an immensely complicated universe of cells that are speaking to each other and somehow promoting vast numbers of functions, many of which have nothing to do with thinking. The man in the street may think that the brain is largely to do with emotions and thinking. It's certainly subserving those functions, but it's maintaining temperature regulation, water balance, reproductive hormones, biological rhythms, countless hosts of, of, of functions. And at this moment, at the end of the 20th century, we don't fully understand the full potential of the brain. We, we? understand practically nothing, to be honest. We, we, we know quite a lot of the phenomena, and they're being studied with great diligence and, and great accuracy. But um, it's a science still in its infancy. It's really only a few decades old. Any drug or agent that affects your mental state must get through to your brain. Now, your brain works by electricity and chemistry. The chemicals in your brain that signal to each other are called neurotransmitters and they lock on to the receptors of other cells to do their business. David Pierce runs BLTC Research. That stands for Better Living Through Chemistry and he wants to make people happier by modifying the brain balance. Basically, the, the mind brain uh, is a community of perhaps thousands of millions of nerve cells and somehow they have to talk to each other because for the most part they're not directly connected and they do so by these little chemicals and the terminals for the, uh, uh, from one cell uh, release these chemicals and these chemicals lock on to receptors which is rather like locks and keys on uh, let's say a nearby cell and this triggers off a whole cascade of events inside the cell and by changing the way our cells talk to each other it's possible to alter mood, it's possible to alter thought uh, it can be done in, a, in, a, in an uncontrolled and dangerous way as in many of our street drugs or it can be done in a, a much more controlled and precision engineered way one of the problems with the mind-brain is that it's got a whole host of mutually inhibitory feedback mechanisms and let's say by boosting one particular neurotransmitter subtype you actually inhibit the function of another transmitter hence in many cases drugs that boost serotonin function impair dopamine function and dopamine is very important a neurotransmitter it's involved in willpower euphoria well-being drive and so it has to you, you really need to have a twin track approach Hang on to two words there, serotonin and dopamine. 
There are two important chemicals in the brain that all the mind and mood altering drugs seem to do things to, blocking them, freeing them, mimicking them in some way. Serotonin is linked to the sleeping waking cycle, to dreaming, to temperature regulation, to moods and the fine tuning of how you see reality. Dopamine is involved in all the pleasures that we feel, to euphoria and to control of sex hormones. And it's on these and on other neurotransmitters that leading edge brain scientists are now focusing. My name is Susan Greenfield. I'm a university professor in pharmacology at Oxford. What is pharmacology actually? Well, people think that pharmacology is all about drugs because that comes from the Greek word for drugs, pharmakos. But really, what we like to think of it as in Oxford is more the study of what we say chemically sensitive sites. We're more concerned with how chemicals working in the body can be modified by agents that some people regard as drugs. So it's not necessarily all about drugs and just drugs on their own, but rather how they work in the body. Let's go back to these receptors, these locks and keys that, mm -hmm. that the uh, a drug or an agent introduced will, will somehow trigger the chemical or fool the brain into thinking mm -hmm. that this is the right key mm -hmm. for this lock. That's right. What I want to ask is how come our brain has mm -hmm. got these locks that match so many so. Uh, you know, cannabis, uh, <laughs> tobacco, opiates, that there are apparently, I've mm -hmm. been told, receptors in the this, brain that match this. That's a fascinating question and perhaps the best example of that, and the most established now, uh, comes from findings in the 1970s that to my mind represented one of the biggest advances in brain research of this century and was discovered in Aberdeen. And what it was found was that we have naturally occurring opiates, morphine, in our brain. And so all that time people knew that morphine was one of the most powerful drugs both in terms of abuse and in terms of analgesia, in terms of therapy. It's one of the oldest and most powerful drugs that we know of is opium, of which morphine is a derivative and heroin a derivative of that. In the 1970s, it was discovered that we had in our body special receptors that the um, opium or the morphine or the heroin could work on. It was then discovered that there was in our bodies a naturally occurring agent, a transmitter, that was just like the morphine. That's called encephalins, literally meaning in the head. And this was held with great excitement, and now we know a lot more that the body does have a mechanism that can be involved in the control of pain, for example. It's also the same agent believed to be released during something called jogger's high. That's to say when people do a lot of long-distance running, after about half an hour they feel euphoric, and that's now associated with increased levels of this Encephalin. Is there a way one can trigger one's own encephalin Indeed. naturally then and not you need any drugs well, at all? Exactly, and this is one of the reasons people try and get people who are depressed to engage in lots more activity. It's undeniable that if you take exercise you do feel a lot better. And another way we know that you can release endorphins is with laughter. And again, a marvellous way. If you could get people to laugh, then if you're doing that rather than taking drugs would be marvellous, there'd be no side effects, it'd be cheap, you wouldn't need a medical practitioner, you couldn't overdose on it, it wouldn't matter what culture or age you were, anyone could do it. With me now is Dr. Andrew Weil, well-known author, his latest book is called Eight Weeks to Optimum Health, he's also the author of Natural Health, Natural Medicine, Spontaneous Healing, and also two books on the subject of plants and drugs. From Chocolate to Morphine, Everything You Need to Know About Mind-Altering Drugs, and a famous book from the 1970s, The Natural Mind, A New Way of Looking at Drugs and the Higher Consciousness. Dr. Weil, can you tell me why are human beings, this species, so interested in intoxication, in altering their moods and their minds? In The Natural Mind, which was published in 72, uh, I postulated that human beings are born with an innate drive to alter consciousness. And this is based on observation. Now, I don't say they're a drive to get intoxicated because I think that's one variety of consciousness alteration. My sense is that what we find most aversive is boredom and what we find most reinforcing is change in the area of consciousness. And I think as you go up the phylogenetic scale, you find this desire to alter consciousness becomes more and more prominent and it reaches its peak in human beings. I also think that uh, human beings in most cultures quickly discover that drugs are one way of satisfying this need. But I think unless society acknowledges that need and addresses it, uh, we have no hope of coming to any terms with intoxicants in our midst. If we take it back 
in, in human history, back into evolutionary history. I mean, how far back does this start, do you think? I think it's there from the beginning. And, and even if you, if you look at drugs, uh, in, you know, which most people early on were using in plant form, uh, the only culture that I know of that was not heavily invested in growing, distributing, using drug plants were traditional Eskimos who had the misfortune not to be able to grow things and had to wait for us to bring them alcohol, which they quickly learned to abuse. One reason why we've evolved a brain at all comes from the fact that we are animals. And if you're an animal, unlike a plant, you're animated. Now, I know that plants, in certain cases, can turn to the light and so on, but they can't translocate unless you believe in the day of the Triffids or something going in. Um, or Red Shakespeare with Burnham Wood. But um, most usually, plants are fixed to one spot, whereas animals, the hallmark of animals is that they are moved, they are animated. And there's a very interesting little story of a tunicator, a sea squirt, a little marine creature, that spends its immature part of its life swimming around and it has a very primitive brain and then it fastens to a rock and lives out its adult life by filtering seawater so it doesn't have to move and once it becomes immobile like this it consumes its own brain so it doesn't it doesn't need a brain once it becomes stationary so the idea is that we've evolved a brain because it enables us to have a rapid interaction with the environment a plant doesn't need that because things for plants don't change very quickly the light changes slowly it doesn't have to make very rapid adjustments to survive, whereas we do, which is why we're equipped effectively with a very quick sensory input of things coming in, so through our five senses we can know what's going on in the world, and of course we can react quickly, we can move, we can run, we can chase, we can hunt. So the brain has evolved as such to enable you, we think, to interact rapidly with the environment. The most fundamental thing is that as animals, any animal is by definition dependent on plants. There are no, no animals that aren't dependent on plants, either directly or indirectly. And therefore, our evolutionary history has been tied in with plants from the very, very beginning. The artist and zoologist Jonathan Kingdon, whose latest authoritative book is The Kingdon Field Guide to African Mammals. We, animals, have been eating plants from the beginning, and that has meant that plants have had to contend with this as a major force, as they've evolved. I think the, the most obvious aspect of it is that the plant is trying to protect itself and producing chemicals which are often highly specific to the particular creature that is its prime enemy. But very often, if it's having a strong effect, it may be right on the edge of being a poison. And we do know that a lot of drugs, a lot of plant compounds, which are taken by animals, by you know, wild mammals, and by human beings, if you take too much of them, of course you die. If you are a particular type of individual, you also die anyway, even if you take a very tiny quantity of it. But if you've got a genetic resistance to it, then you may be able to take it in quite large quantities without it doing any harm. It may indeed even give you pleasure. And the chemistry of, of plants is such that it can affect so many different... We're, we're a, a web of systems. I mean, we've got a blood system, a nerve system, a, uh, we're, we're coping with air, we're coping with temperature, we're coping with uh, so many different environmental pressures and for all of those there are chemical balances that are just right and we can push one way or the other and we may actually enjoy getting you know rather hot or rather cold as a result of of taking some kind of spice which has that physiological effect on us now for somebody else or for another animal just making it making you feel hot or making you feel cold may be the thing that tips them towards death if you like and so it is a, a definite deterrent to another animal so we're actually latching onto the plant's strategy against other animals to a, a great degree because the vast majority of the plants that we do use as drugs and that we do use as, uh, as compounds to stimulate ourselves or whatever none of them were designed for us because most of them are not African and we are African apes by origin and so all our sort of highly refined relationships with plants are all restricted to the plants of 
the African forests and the African savannas. Space. Space. My name is Christian Rich. Um, my basic professional field is ethnopharmacology, and uh, I'm specialized in the use of plants by indigenous people, and also specialized on shamanism. And um, I do a lot of traveling and researching collecting plants, trying them out, taking pictures, writing books, articles, do some lecturing here and there. And um, I've been almost in every place on this planet. You're the author as well of a dictionary of sacred and uh, magical plants. You're an ethnopharmacologist. You study how native people use these plants. How far back does human interaction with plants go? Well, uh, to the beginning, I mean, it's very difficult to estimate how long people use plants, but uh, they use them since earliest times. And there is uh, also some evidence that uh, plants were already used for magical purposes or for healing or for rituals in Paleolithic times. And we have some evidence that uh, Neanderthal man already uh, used some bioactive and even psychoactive plants yeah, as offerings to the dead or something like that. And uh, from the earliest beginning of writing, we have uh, records of the use of plants for healing, for magic, for offerings to the gods and goddesses, and uh, the use of incense. I mean, plant materials had been used uh, as incense almost everywhere and from all the written sources we have uh, records that this is part of human culture since culture is formed. Smoke is something right at the root of our distinctness that is homo as distinct from you know gorillas and chimpanzees. Smoke is one of the things that defines us because when we built fires and we sat either in caves or in shelters over a fire, we would, we would have exposed ourselves to an enormous amount of smoke. And probably any individuals that were hypersensitive to smoke were eliminated through natural selection at a very early stage in our, in our ancestry. And this is pure guesswork but I would be very surprised if there weren't particular woods that people say, oh, lovely, I really like that smell. And they would have selectively collected those woods uh, when they wanted a kick out of it. But they would have just been put into the fire for maybe a million years that might have occurred. And they would have just kept them and stuck them in the thing. And eventually, then it would begin to be controlled. I think this is confirmed by early archaeology. There are a lot of sensors, they call them, either for burning opium or for burning cannabis, that yes, are right. seeds or leaves are put on and the smoke comes off. And that could be, in a, in a way, the first step towards having a pipe. I think you have to find the roots of nearly all these things in hunting people, much more than in agricultural people. Hunting people would have known so much more about animals and plants than any agricultural people. Agricultural people, by definition, have narrowed their relationships with animals and plants to a, a minuscule degree. And foragers really know an enormous amount about their environment. They may clothe it with lots of mythology, but even the mythology generally has some sort of strand that links it in a functional way with, its, with the the organism's real biology. To me, one of the most interesting findings is that the human brain has receptors that fit molecules produced by plants. And that's very curious. 
Now, why, why does the brain have receptors that fit molecules produced by the opium plant? I mean, that certainly suggests that there is a link between human beings and human consciousness and plants uh, that extends very far back in time. Some would say this is purely an accident, but are you saying, suggesting that there is a co-evolution here? Yeah. You know, even uh, if another, another one, we find uh, the neurotransmitter molecules, molecules like serotonin, for example, in one-celled organisms. You know, so these seem to be molecules that are very conserved in evolution. Um, uh, to me, it suggests that there's, there is linkage. Andrew Weil. Now, one man who spent much of his life exploring that linkage between plants and people is the writer Terence McKenna, the impish guru of natural psychedelics. I first came across Terence McKenna when he co-edited with Howard Rheingold the fall 1989 issue of that always interesting California-based magazine, Whole Earth Review, a remarkable issue whose cover story was The Alien Intelligence of Plants. Terence McKenna. Plants represent an order of existence that is completely alien to most people, and yet all around us. Plants cannot move away from their toxic byproducts. Consequently, they have a great uh, stake in recycling and keeping the atmosphere and the environment uh, clean and uncontaminated. Uh, plants have a wonderful integrated passivity that makes them a model for certain aspects of human consciousness. So, basically, we just wanted to call attention to this alien life form in our midst, often as saturated with neurotransmitters as our own brains are, and then to discuss the ways in which human beings can uh, contact or participate in this kind of consciousness. One of the things you suggest in, in your article, the, the sort of keynote article of this whole Earth Review, Plan, Plant, Planet, mm -hmm. is that you could see the green world as having influenced us enormously. Not us in control, but the plant world has been controlling the mammal life. Well, an evolutionary biologist once remarked somewhat facetiously that animals are something invented by plants to move seeds around. And if you stand back and look at it, that's not far wrong. Uh, plant life dominated the planet long before the rise of higher animals. And uh, uh, plants continue to be the major life form on the planet. The atmosphere is uh, controlled by the, the uh, gaseous intake and outtake of plants. Many plants live in the sea and establish the environment of the oceans. This is really a plant planet. And animal life is only an incidental and late addition to biology here. The issue also points out that plants can defend themselves and, and, and work through chemicals, and immensely subtle chemicals. And is it your case that, in fact, it is those chemical messages that have helped human beings? Well, it's a great mystery why plants would produce and sequester compounds that have no apparent role in their own metabolism. And I think once you entertain the idea that these so-called tertiary compounds are uh, messenger molecules, pheromones, if you will, then what emerges is the picture of biology united into a seamless web by the exchange of message bearing chemicals in the environment. We communicate with spoken language, but insect societies are run by pheromones, and it now appears that many plant activities are mediated uh, by these same messenger chemicals. Essentially, chemicals lie beneath the surface of language and communication in plants and animals. Nature is trying to communicate with human beings.
with almost all of these drugs, I mean, same with cannabis, although we didn't discover this in the quite recently, there's a receptor in the brain you know, for THC. So there is a fit between our brains and the substances produced by plants. Now, what does this tell us then? I mean, what is the... the well, you know, uh, many scientists and medical scientists get very upset if you try to read meaning into all of this, uh, but I've never hesitated to do that. Um, to me, it suggests that there is a logic in our wanting to go around and experiment with plants and see what they do to us. My sense, and this again was a major point of the natural mind, is that the reason that there is this evolutionary drive to alter consciousness is that these experiences potentially are doorways through which we can discover expanded potentials of the human mind and human consciousness. The potential benefits to be gained through this kind of experimentation are probably great for us as a species. And that's why this drive is so present. So, in fact, legislating about it, if it is such a primary evolutionary drive, legislating... It is and futile. I mean, it's that simple. And uh, furthermore, uh, there is not a shred of evidence from anthropology or history to suggest that it is possible to get human beings to live without mind-altering substances. As I said, the only culture that's out there that I know that has done that were Eskimos. But every other human culture that I've ever looked at has been heavily involved with the production, distribution, and consumption of mind-altering substances. And then you start from there and see, well, what can we do about it? You know, how can we reduce the potential for harm? Uh, how can we encourage people, uh, if they're going to use these things, to use them in responsible ways and so forth? But I think any social program that begins from the assumption that you can make these substances disappear or stop people from using them is doomed to failure. Radio series about mind altering drugs in nature and culture. Written and presented by Nick Rankin. Plants of Power. Program 2 Spirit Power. Well, history shows that we have always used drugs. In every age, in every part of this planet, people have pursued intoxication with plant drugs with fermented fruits and other types of chemical substances. Psychopharmacologist Ron Siegel, author of Intoxication and Fire in the Brain. And surprisingly, we're not the only animals that do that. Our research teams have found many examples of other animals that pursue intoxication with plant drugs and fermented fruits. And this drive to intoxication is so strong, it's so persistent, that it functions very much like the drives of sex, hunger, and thirst that motivate us, that motivate our lives, and that drive our behavior. There's no region of the world really where plants grow that people haven't used them, not only for medical reasons and for food, but also for their psychoactive properties. Richard Rudgley is an anthropologist. He's the author of Alchemy of Culture, Intoxicants in Society, and a forthcoming encyclopedia of psychoactive substances. So what do the plants of power do? Basically, you can divide them simply into a few categories. You have plants which are called stimulants, obvious ones being the coffee and tea plant, but those cultures have their equivalents, which basically help you when you're feeling tired or to give you extra energy for some mental or physical task. Then you have hallucinogenic plants which cause visionary or auditory hallucinations. Then you have what are called hypnotic plants, a lot of which, such as opium, cause states where basically they're the opposite of stimulants. They make people relax, they relieve mental or psychological pain or physical pain obviously where they interface with medical use. 
And finally, you have the inebriants, which the most classic one, of course, being alcohol. Now, there's a stream of intoxicants that flow through our lives today. It doesn't matter whether we wake up with a cup of coffee or a line of cocaine or we take a break from our work with uh, a cigarette or a beer or we relax after work with a cocktail or a joint of marijuana or we try to get to sleep at night with uh, something we bought at the pharmacy or something we bought from our street corner dealer. People use drugs to change the way in which they feel. We are chemical organisms. Our brain is a three-pound sack of chemicals. Of course, we're more than that. But we are that too. And our brain manufactures lots of natural chemicals. We manufacture opiates, which are as strong as any kind of heroin or morphine. Our brain manufactures dimethyltryptamine, a hallucinogen that is stronger than LSD. Our brain manuf and our nervous system manufactures adrenaline, which is a stimulant that's as strong as any crack or am amphetamine. So it's natural that in foraging around in our environment on this planet, we will find other chemical substances that we have affinity to that hit our receptors and strike us as being pleasant. And it's also going to be natural that we're going to find chemicals that we don't like, that we respond to with aversion. So we are just responding to these chemicals. But how people respond to chemicals depends, we're told, on the set and the setting. That's the set of ideas or expectations someone has about the substance, and the setting is the place and time and the other people around you when you take it. It does matter whether this is a sacred ceremony or a casual habit. Richard Rudgley thinks that for the earliest people, the astonishing chemical reactions of certain plants had spiritual consequences. There is no question when you look at the archaeological literature, the literature of the ancient world, and also the experiences of contemporary tribal peoples, particularly shamans, that psychoactive plants have had a central role in the religious history of mankind. Now you used the word shaman there. Can you explain to me what a shaman is and the, and the origin of, of this word? Well, the word itself comes from a, a Siberian tribe and then it was used by the Russians and from, from there it reached the Western world. And now it generally means people who are living in tribal societies who have what in other areas are called medicine men, but they go specifically into trance states in which they perceive the origin of diseases and then by medical practices they seek to cure their patients. Often, and this is where it's rather different from Western medicine, by them taking the drugs rather than administering them to their patients. Uh, Saman or Shaman is a Tungus word from, from one of the tribes of Siberia. That's right, yes. Are plants in any way, psychoactive plants, mind-altering plants, involved in shamanism in its original place of origin? Well, in Siberia there are certain peoples who use the fly agaric mushroom in shamanism the uh, famous fly agaric mushroom, which is the well-known mushroom of fairy tale illustration with the, the red and white cap. It's, it's one of the naturally occurring hallucinogenic substances. <laughs> For the tribal hunter-gatherer, living embedded in nature and instinct and surviving by skill with animals and plants, the mental world is the spiritual world. A mind-altering plant, changing the nature of reality when ingested, would, for our prehistoric ancestors, have been a sacred plant. For who could doubt this fruit of Eden's stunning power of ecstasy and trance? And who could not respect the strange person, the shaman or shaman, possessed by that power, or somehow channeling its impulses and insights? 
I think, yes, shamans are very interesting because they, they clearly belong to the hunter-food-gatherer phase. Artist and zoologist of Africa, Jonathan Kingdom. Anybody who could actually invoke hidden powers to provide fruit, the person would have been almost turned into a shaman anyway. And that does seem to have been one of the roles of shamans, that they, they actually interceded with the hidden powers to provide or to create the harmonious situation in which there would be plenty of food. And I think that there, there again, this mystery, the mystery of how you could starve sometimes and you could be full of plenty at another. Uh, the food was very, very abundant, and then suddenly it would be withheld. It was so easy for people to actually see this as the result of a malevolent power, which was a projection of, of a, if you like, a, a senior person. So a senior person then became the agent, in a sense, for this hidden power. And that, I, I think, would have been the sort of sequence that would have led to shamans. But this is purely speculation, obviously. And I don't think there's any evidence anywhere for the, the real origins of shamanism. I definitely think that the origin of shamanism was uh, the human encounter with psychoactive plants because these plants are still the most important tool in shamanism to enter the other realities. Ethnopharmacologist Christian Rech, author of another forthcoming encyclopedia of psychoactive plants in German. We have now so much evidence for the worldwide use of psychoactive plants as the main tools of shamanism that we can really suppose that this is the original method and that it, it's very old and that the plants actually produced shamanism and they also produced what we might call religion or mysticism or something like that. That is an idea that Weston Labar, the uh, anthropologist, author of the famous book, The Peyote Cult, proposed in an essay that in fact the origins of the sacred and of religion itself is in consciousness changing plants. Do you hold to that view too? Of course, I mean definitely. I mean it's really easy to understand if uh, you take a psychoactive plant by yourself. You're just thrown into another world, into another reality and there you see unbelievable things, you meet uh, incredible creatures and uh, all kinds of stuff is happening and uh, if uh, you experience this by yourself then you uh, can feel that uh, there is another reality and that this reality is very important to know and to interact with because uh, this other reality is not uh, separated from our visible world. It's like imminent. It's in this world. Professor Susan Greenfield of Oxford University. We've been talking about religion here and, and drugs. People want to change their consciousness. You could have an ecstatic vision, perhaps you could have an experience of God in some way. It would change your life. Now, consciousness, our, our sense of knowing ourselves, what is, here's the most simple question of all, what is the relationship between our brain, the physical wetware in our skull, and our consciousness? Well, if I could answer that, I think by now... <laughs> you have the Nobel Prize. Uh, well, at the very least, the Nobel Prize. That'd be, uh, that, of course, is the, one of the biggest challenges in biology today and one that fascinates me. I find it the most exciting question one can ask. Now, that doesn't mean to say one can answer it. I think one must, first of all, draw a distinction between consciousness and self-consciousness in that most other animals, and indeed very young children, are not self-conscious and that you don't have a rat looking at itself in the mirror saying, God, I'm a rat, I don't think. But consciousness, leaving aside self-consciousness, consciousness itself is a, a fascinating issue and one that I think actually, to come full circle, drugs will offer us the most progress in understanding for the following reason. 
if you just look at properties of the brain, as people that build in computers do, or indeed like many neuroscientists do, where they're looking at the electrical signals, then you never know how those electrical signals will match up or cause you enjoying the sun on your face or the feel of fresh grass on your bare feet. You'll never know those things. Philosophers, on the other hand, say that what's important is the subjective experience of consciousness, the feel of my headache to me. Now, until recently, it's been very hard to bring those two worlds together to understand subjective feelings, sort of feelings that, let's say, a drug will give you, with what happens in the brain. But it strikes me that drugs are indeed the bridge, the kind of bilingual link, if you like, because we can talk about how the drug works in physical terms, how it affects the transmitters and the receptors and the neurons. And, of course, you can have someone saying how they feel when they take a drug or reporting their experiences. So as long as you don't mind having a second-hand insight into someone's consciousness, that is to say, as long as you don't mind having to rely on what they report, their subjective reports, you can start to match up subjective sensations with what we know they're doing to chemicals in the brain, the more we might start to have some insight into how those reactions related to those chemicals in the brain. One kind of drug that we haven't talked about are the hallucinogens. Surely. Now, this is a, uh, mm-hmm. an interesting mental experience. Mm-hmm. What is happening if people are hallucinating? Okay, well, it's not just people that take hallucinogenic drugs that can hallucinate. We know that uh, certain types of schizophrenia can lead to the illusion that you're hearing voices or that there's cameras hidden in the light bulbs that are, are watching you. So, Fever can do it. Yes, indeed. So we know that it's not just drug-induced. Um, one could argue almost that when you dream, you're hallucinating because you're certainly not registering simply what is out there in the environment because nothing is there. So I wouldn't like to think of just the LSD taker as the only person that's hallucinating, although they are a good example of it. Now, this is one example of when I said drugs can be used as a bridge to understanding what people feel and what's happening in their brain. Hallucinogens offer a very exciting bridge between those two worlds if you like the fact that you can see something glowing colors or you can see something that's not there at all raises the question of the brain not just as some passive sponge that is taking in the inputs from the outside world but is actually doing something generating something in its own right that gives you that illusion i use a very useful analogy which helps simplify and explain what goes on inside the brain when someone is having an hallucination Think of a man sitting in a study, and he's looking out the window, and he sees the people walking out on the street and the traffic moving by. And as night falls and he looks out the window, he can no longer see out because it's completely dark. But let's say he has a fireplace behind him, and he stokes the fire, and the fire burns brightly, and he turns around to look out the window. He still can't see out because it's dark, but he sees a reflection of himself in the glass and the furniture reflected as if it came from the outside. The analogy is that the window is the window of our eyes, our ears, and our senses to the real world. And the fire is the degree of electrical excitation that many drugs can produce in the brain. So when it's dark at night, not much is happening, and the fire roars brightly, you have a lot of LSD in your brain, let's say. You may no longer see the real world, but you see the furniture of your own mind, memories, your images, your fantasies reflected as if they came from the outside. And some people become like Alice, going through the looking glass. They believe all of this stuff is really there. The good news is that as soon as the fire dies down and the drug wears off or is counteracted by another drug, perception returns to normal and you begin to see your own reflection again and you begin to see the room. Ron Siegel's clear example is the materialist scientific way to see this brain event. But it's not how the old ecstatic shamans think. They do step through that window or penetrate the membrane to the other side. The hallucination is true, says Christian Rech. For me it's so clear and obvious that uh, the plants contain something which might be called a spirit or a soul or some consciousness and when I ingest uh, such a plant I have the feeling uh, that uh, this part of the plant uses my own consciousness to express itself through me. 
What you've just been saying confirms exactly what Terence McKenna was saying to me, in that in evolutionary terms, the plants need animals not only to propagate their seeds, but to communicate. Yeah. Because animals can move and plants can't. So, are you saying that part of the, the story of the shaman is that the plant is teaching the shaman? Of course, and uh, the shamans uh, view plants as teachers, as masters, and as uh, allies. And uh, they say, if I take a plant, the spirit uh, of the plant will talk to me, and I can ask the spirit, hey, what you for? What you are... What is your purpose? What can you do? Can I use you for healing or can I use you for something else or uh, how to prepare the plant and all this stuff? And so uh, there is a dialogue between the shaman and the plant and the shaman learns from the plant and then he later can use this knowledge to use the plant wisely and... Um, I think uh, that is the best view for understanding psychoactive substances and plants, that they are teachers and we learn from them and what we learn from them is very important for ourselves, for our community, for the earth and maybe for the whole universe. We never know. Not all shamans use mind-altering plants, but all shamans use music and trance to achieve ecstasy. Shamanism is found in all continents, often hidden and out of the way. Shamanism is still strong in South Korea. The shaman there, man or woman, is called Mudang, and the symbol is a tree between earth and sky and two dancing figures. My name is Cho. Cho Hung. Huh? Similar name is Cho, and I'm professor of uh, cultural anthropology at Hanyang University, specialized in religious uh, anthropology. What is the history of shamanism in, in Korea? When, when does it begin? You know, from the beginning of the, uh, the Korean history, uh, it is well known that the uh, founder of uh, Korea, Dangun, was a shaman. You know, at that time, the religion and the politics is not uh, separated, you know. So Tangun was a shaman, and met the kings uh, till the uh, beginning of the uh, so-called three kingdoms, say, third, fourth centuries, they were uh, shamans. It is so accepted in, in Korean history. What is the connection between shamanism in South Korea and shamanism in, say, um, Central Asia and Mongolia. Is there a connection? Yes. The Korean shamanism has, uh, in, in many elements, something to do with uh, the Central Asian or Siberian shamanism. Uh, example, you know, the dance and the ecstasy or the crown, you know. The well known Korean, the so called national treasure, the kumgwan, the golden crown, uh, as the uh, typical shamanistic head covering. That's uh, the Siberian tradition. This is the Kyongju National Museum in the southeast of Korea. And right in front of me, behind a glass cabinet, is one of the headdresses that the person is talking about. These are the headdresses, the golden headdresses of the original shamanic kings of Sila. And there's a circlet of gold that goes around the temple, but above them, sticking up like trees, are these towering gold ornaments. They look exactly like trees, or they could be horns, and they're hung with coins of gold, beaten coins of gold, and cashew nut shaped pale jade jewelry. And it's like a forest of trees above the shaman's head. The shaman then was a king as well as a priest. On his head he wore the great symbols, the power plants of his religious and political power.
The American Indians originated out of Central Asia and came across the Bering Strait. And yet the New World seems to have more mind-altering plants than the old, at least that were discovered and used by people. Why is this? Richard Schultes, who's the, the world's leading expert on, on the botany of hallucinogenic plants, has said that this isn't down to natural factors. In other words, it's not because the plants aren't there. It's, he's has been seeking a cultural explanation. And in conjunction with the theories of Western Lavar, who you've already mentioned, what we're looking at is the survival of shamanic cultures much longer in the New World than in many parts of the Old World. Now, if we look at shamanism, shamanism has uh, a direct contact with the world of the spirit or the world of the divine. Are you saying that the cultural explanation is that the people who came from Asia, who had, I don't know, vision quests or wanted altered states, were therefore actively looking for plants that would help them do this? Well, this is the suggestion of the bar, and I think it makes a lot of sense because if you go back way back, basically when societies were much simpler, generally speaking, the men did the hunting and the women gathered the plants. So we would expect that they were the ones perhaps who discovered many of these psychoactive plants. I think they obviously they were looking for food plants, we know that. They were looking for medical plants and really in a lot of native cultures the difference between medical use and what we would call drug use is not so clearly uh, defined as is in our own culture. So a hallucinogenic plant would be considered purely on, on that criteria alone to have medical properties. So they would have valued it and so they would have been looking for it as they pushed into new environments. And they certainly discovered them because the New World has, I believe, Schultes has said, over a hundred plants that are used for their psychoactive properties. Whereas in the Old World, with the rise of the world religions, for example, Christianity, Islam, and also with the Judaic tradition, these religions, although of course we have wine as a sacrament and so on, they don't, well they in fact actively resist the idea of using hallucinogenic plants, obviously in part of their religious quest. So they have tended to suppress or to simply wipe out these earlier religious traits. Professor Cho, you're an expert on Korean shamanism. Mm. Now, do we not say that shamanism is in fact the first religion, the primal mm. religion mm. of the earliest peoples? Yes, you're right. You know, according to the religious evolutionism, hmm? the shamanism was always a, a first place of the history of the religion. Well, it's uh, good, but uh, uh, in interpretation of this uh, evolutionism, we have regarded the shamanism as a, you know, the uh, primitive. primitive. It's nonsense. Hmm? Typical ethnocentrism. Uh, you know, the Western civilization or the Christian civilization or the uh, mechanistic civilization have ruined so much the environment or the, 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 the beautiful nature of the world huh? and shamanism. You know, such kind of a religion is very important for the Aboriginal people. They have their own philosophy and their, their own uh, their wonderful, I would say, harmonious world, you know, and they've lost in Korean shamanism, you know, they always think that we are persecuted, etc. Eh? The shamans cannot say openly that uh, we are shamans. They lie, you know. No, so I'm, I believe in Buddhism, etc. So, it's a repressed belief system. It is hidden, mm. but it runs like, like a river mm. underground. You may not see it, but the river is still running. Mm. Uh, not underground. Yeah, underground. You're right. And I would say the shadow, hmm? or in, in in night, at night. You know, the Korean shamanism is believed at night. Huh? Very strong still, but at, at days, you know, <laughs> they, they they must uh, hide themselves. You know, 
in the daylight world of Hyundai and Samsung and Daewoo, is it? <laughs> Different gods. And we'll be looking at how industry and empire profaned the sacred plants next week. Till then, goodbye.